the title of the topic is Israel's Formation and Independence, a Nation on the Crossroads. And uh, to speak on this important topic, we have uh, Mr. Jyoti Ranjan Pradhan, who is the Director of for Outreach and Initiatives at Young Diplomats Paris. He is a student of international relations and security. He holds an MA in political science, security, and diplomacy studies from Tel Aviv University, Israel, where, uh, where he was uh, a Tata scholar. His studies focus on Israel and its uh, security, among other things. His thesis was in the field of security studies. He in turn as research assistant at the Jerusalem Institute of Security and Strategy, working on Israel, Jerusalem, Iran, he has undergone a course on public diplomacy from Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Stand With Us Foundation. He has traveled extensively within Israel, Palestine, that is West Bank, uh, Jordan, and uh, participated in the field visits to Israel's borders with Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and the Gaza perimeter. We have uh, such a wonderful personality with us. Uh, just to share one minute. Uh, actually, I really had uh, this topic in my mind and I was uh, really looking for a speaker. And uh, by God's grace, God, by God's grace, uh, Mr. Jyoti, you know, we got in touch and finally we were able to uh, fix uh, uh, two lectures. So today uh, he is going to deliver uh, one lecture and uh, the next lecture will be delivered uh, in April. And uh, we have dedicated uh, his talks uh, uh, to the uh, to the Israel special, uh, and uh, in this context, uh, I really hope that we will get uh, opportunity to have an insight uh, in this uh, complicated uh, problem of Israel and also the Jewish nationalism and Israel's formation and independence. Uh, Mr. Jyoti, I, I again, once again, welcome you on behalf of uh, Tetsu College, my, my students uh, and faculty members. I request you to kindly please uh, take a charge of this uh, virtual stage. It is all yours. And please do enlighten us about Israel, Israel's history, Genesis, how and what exactly the Jewish soul is yearning for, which we really understand from their national anthem. Sir, please over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Anuruddha, for the gracious introduction. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ave Vidari, Dr. Rasa Lorin, Mr. Kolo Ronin, Lorin, and Pierce Lorin, and also the Tetsu College as a whole, and Doc Talks for giving me this opportunity to be with you all today. And I'm indeed humbled and grateful to you all for allowing me this opportunity today. So before we start, uh, you can all just take a sip of water or something and just give us some time. And I'd like to request you all to uh, feel free to ask me any question. Uh, meanwhile, while this is going on, uh, you can send me questions in the chat box or you can uh, DM me on Twitter or you can, uh, it's better to just leave it on the chat box or just write it on pen and paper and we can start. But before we start, uh, we will start the presentation first with history, and we'll go through entirely what all it's about. I'm sharing my screen. Please let me know if you can see my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, very much. Hello? OK, so you can see a PowerPoint? Yes, yes. OK, so I'll start presenting. So Israel's formation and independence. Uh, but before we come to the present day, like always, we'll start from history and some biblical and ancient history first. So first, we all know there's Noah, not this one, uh, the famous one, the one with the ark. So and Noah has three sons. One of them is Shem. And Shem has a son called many sons, but one of them being Aprashad. And then there is Salah, who is his son. And then his, he has a son called Eber. Now, if we go down this line, several generations, we come up with Abraham. Uh, if you can see my pointer at the bottom of this timeline or uh, the genealogy, and we can see that Abraham is the one 
with whom all the three Abrahamic religions start. So at first we are talking about the biblical story. So Abraham the Ivory, as he was known, he was from the city of Ur, where my cursor is right now, in the Mesopotamia. And his house was not far from the Euphrates River's bank. And he was called Abraham the Ivory as in Abraham the Hebrew, the people Hebrew. And Ivory actually meant Abraham the, from the other side. So it, I believe that his house was probably on the other side of river with respect to his friends whom he used to meet regularly. And somewhere around 1900 BC, he, may, he gets to interact with God. And he is asked to move to the land of Canaan, which he does. His trail is shown on the screen in points, in white points. And he goes there as instructed by God. But there's a famine, he has to go to Egypt. And the story goes on. He has a son by the name of Isaac. We all know him. The image is there for your reference. And then he has a son by the name of Jacob, who has to, at a time, he has to, he steals a blessing from his father under his mother's instruction. And then he has to run away to his uncle Laban's home. And on the way, he has to, for one, one day he has to return after getting married to Leah and his second wife. He has to wrestle. And what happens is that it is that who is he wrestling with? Maybe he's wrestling with an angel. Some say he was wrestling with the spirit of Esau, whose identity he had stolen to get the blessing. But he is someone who's dealing with God, some may say. So he's the one who comes to be known as Israel, the name from which the state of Israel gets its name. And But if you look at it from a more social point of view, the state of Israel will say that they have taken the name from the ancient biblical kingdom of Israel. Now, Jacob has Sire's 12 sons, one of them also sires two more, so there are actually 13 sons, but there are 12 tribes. The Kohen and the Levi don't get a kingdom of their own because they serve the temple and the people. And the other tribes, they get a kingdom each. And these are the 12 tribes, the 12 sons. And yeah, so on the right side of the screen, if you see, you'll see the 12 tribes. And we know the story of Joseph and then the story of Moses, how Moses is the one who brings the Jews back from Egypt, from slavery. He is blessed and on the way back in Sinai, he gets the laws of God, the tablets. So Dr. Anirudak, am I clear? Am I audible? Can you see me? And yes, see? yes, yes, okay. yes, go ahead. So yeah. I guess some of you are lawyers, like Dr. Anirudha is, and you might have all seen these two bands. Uh, what's in Hindi is called Sanat. So those are the bands of Moses, the two tablets of laws. And with Moses, actually, we get the first laws of men. And by 1020 BC, a person by the name of Saul, a warrior, he is anointed as the king because the Jews of the land are like, oh, all our neighbors have kings. We also want to be part of this party. And But Saul is not exactly the king. For instance, it is King David upon whose ascendance Israel finally gets a state, you could say a sociological state. And his son Solomon builds the first temple. So this resurrection of the temple, the worship, uh, organized bureaucracy, a ruling class, a people who are the ruled. So we have some segment of a state, but not in the modern state sort of way, not in the Westphalian or uh, the Montevideo form of state, but we have a sociological state which has now finally taken place. And, and the rule of Solomon, we can actually say with full confidence that a state has been formed. The borders of that state are shown in the right side, in the figure. We can see that it goes all the way from Aleppo, Damascus, and all the way to the modern day cities of Aqaba and Elath in the south. And we have also found out the seal of King David in 2015, the image on your screen, that's the seal of King David. It was found by a Russian teenager who had come to Israel and he was participating in an archaeological dig. And at first they thought it's a coin from King David's time, but it was a seal. So we have also archaeological proof that the state existed. And after some time, what happens is that the entire Jewish polity gets divided into two parts. The northern Kingdom of Israel consists of the 10 tribes and the southern one consists of two tribes. And we see that the northern one for some time is kind of prosperous. It kind of has even relations, international relations, should we say, 
with the uh, people in the north, the Assyrians. Uh, but things don't always go as planned. What happens is that by 735 BC, the Assyrians are uh, they are trying to meddle in the kingdoms of Israel and Aram, which are in the north. And what Israel wants is that Judah, the kingdom to the south, where the two tribes are ruling instead of 10 that are in Israel, the 10 tribes want the other two to join them should they have a fight with Assyrians. But Judah, the king of Judah, quietly sends a message to the Assyrians that we would like to join you if you defend us. And the Assyrians instead attack the kingdom of Israel. And the first time we see that the people of Israel are sent to exile under the Assyrians. And later in 586 BC, we see that Judah itself is conquered as well, because this time the Babylonians, they have come to power. And under Nebuchadnezzar, they have take the siege the temple. That's the first temple is destroyed. And 20,000 Jews are exiled for 70 years. And this is some this gives us an idea of what the temple could have been by the time it was destroyed. And what we see is that uh, after 70 years, the Persian Empire is on the rise, and their king Cyrus, he takes over Babylon. So he also gets to inherit all these uh, people who have been exiled into Babylon and he sets them free. But now we see 42,000 return. So some of you can ask me the question, oh, 20,000 20, people went into exile and after 70 years, 42,000 return. Well, if someone has a question, you can ask me later. And we also see this, we have evidence, archaeological evidence. There's the Cyrus cylinder that belonged to 538 BC that was found. It is really present in the British Museum. And it states that I, Cyrus, king of Babylonia, Maduk, the great Lord, bless me. And I built for them a permanent temple. He basically sends the people to go back and tells them, you are free, build your temple again. And he and his descendants, they sanction the construction of temple. But uh, sometimes things don't always happen as we want. And we, if some of you are aware, most of you should, might be, becomes the story of Esther, the school of Esther. So what happens is that in the Persian empire, there's Mordecai uh, who works under the king and he's a cousin of Esther. And the king once decides to get married because his wife, his previous queen hadn't followed his instruction and his advisor said that you better leave her. And so Esther is chosen as the wife, but he has a, an official in the court by the name of Haman, who is seen as one of the first anti-Semites of the time, even today, if you have to go back in history, Haman would be seen as one of the earliest anti-Semites. And what we see is that uh, Esther rescues the people when Haman is trying to kill the Jews of Persia. And the, finally Esther has a way and the king, Darius, I guess he was, no, it was King Xerxes, yeah. So Xerxes, what happens is that he says that, okay, the Jews are free, no one will touch you. But back in the time, rules could not, laws could not be rolled back. So he initiates new laws to ensure that the Jews don't suffer. And Time goes on, and those people who returned from Persia, who had been started refurbishing the temple that had been destroyed in 586 BC, they start doing more, they start building more. And the temple that we get is something, as you can see on the screen on the left side, it is built under the direction of Jerubabil, Zerubabil, and the temple is decent enough, not grand as it would become in later days, and by 332 BC, we see that Alexander the Great, Alexander of Macedon, decides to conquer as much of the world as he can. And he also conquers the promised land, the Holy Land. And after his death, his successors, the Diadochi, the generals, they decide to divide up the kingdom. So here, the Israel is stuck between the Ptolemies, who are ruling from Egypt, and the Seleucids, who are ruling all the way from India's border to Syria. And there's change of hands, and Jews are trying to play both sides. And finally, there is a king by the name of Antiochus III, who's not that good, but he's followed by a ruler who's even worse, Antiochus IV. And when, because Israelis are under them, the Jews are, and then they are like, they have a bad time, you can say, because not only is the temple, are the temple matters being interfered with, the Jews and their way of living, that's being affected. And there are a lot of Hellenistic inroads being made into the temple life. So we see increasingly uh, Greek pagan practices being introduced into the temple, 
the temple of Solomon, or now we have the second temple now. So around 166 BC, uh, there is a sort of a rebellion. This is known as the rebellion of the Maccabees, and it is led by a family known as the Hasmoneans. So what happens is that the king's men, they go around and they have their way everywhere. But when they come to this small place near Jerusalem, a little bit to the west, the Hasmoneans decide that they are not going to kneel. That they are, and earlier also others were not kneeling down, but they were willing to die for the cause of God, for the sake of their religion. They're willing to die. But the Hasmoneans decide that they are not going to die. They are the ones who are going to fight back. So they fight back and they ensure that sovereignty of the Jews is restored. For them, sovereignty had been given to them in the form of laws to Moses, and they have restored it back under Maccabees. And the Maccabees stamp their coins. You can see the two images of the two kind of coins there. And I'll show you later how these coins have inspired the coins that are being used today in Israel. They have the same image. You can see the coin and you can see, oh, the same pattern. And under Maccabees, they are known as Maccabees because the leader was Matthias and his son was Judah, Judah the Hammer. That's Judah the Maccabee. And he's the one who captures Jerusalem and restores the temple. The temple, which had been too Hellenized, is now back under Jewish control. But none of them declare themselves as the king. The guy who does that is Aristobulus. And he declares himself as the king. And thus, Jewish sovereignty is restored. We have a state in the sociological sense. And this is a moment of pride for Jews because they have shown that they can fight back and they can stand their ground. And within 26 years, the Romans, not the Greeks, they recognize Israel. And thus there's some kind of a relationship between the Roman Empire and this nascent kingdom of the Maccabees. But there are civil wars as in any society of that time. And the Maccabees are fighting amongst themselves. There's Salome Alexandra, the queen who tries to broker some peace, but things don't go as per plan. Finally, the Romans are knocking on the doors. There's a five month siege, Rome wins. And we could say that the Hasmoneans have had their day in the sun and the sun has set upon their dynasty. Now, what happens is that there is a guy who used to be a descendant of an Amalekite or Edomite who had been converted to Judaism under the force of power of the Hasmoneans. And he who has taken power under Roman tutelage and he builds a great relationship with Mark Antony later on. The same Mark Antony was famous for Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, Cleopatra, that one. And this guy is Herod the Great. He's the one who builds a relationship. He's the one who takes power under this. He's basically suzerain of the Romans. And he's started gaining all the power. And he's someone who's famous. He's Herod the Builder, not Herod. Agrippas or Antipas, not that one. So he builds these famous structures, as you can see on your screen. He builds the Caesarea city and he also builds the Masada. Now, Masada is a very important thing in our story today that we are discussing. And these places still exist that you are seeing on your screen, except the temple, which has been destroyed. And the Romans increasingly have more feet within the shoe called Israel. And Israel, you could say, have lost its sovereignty. Because now it's a small province within the larger governorate of Syria. And Syria has a governor. And he is the overlord for Israel, these lands, the Jewish lands. And the governor is under the Romans. And you can see the evolution of the temple. 70 CE, the Romans, they sacked the temple. They destroyed it. And this temple that they sacked is the one that was built by Herod. The amazing temple. You can see on the right side. So the first one is the Solomon's temple. And it was refurbished as temple two by Zerubbabel. And the Zerubbabel temple, the second temple, is refurbished and made into this amazing temple, the massive temple that you see on the right side. Now we spoke of some rebellions and all that. So we'll just put them on a timeline here. And we see that in 66 C, uh, there's a great revolt that leads to Romans to destroy the temple. And this is the big revolt. It is said that almost a million Jews died, but there are debates on the number. And the destruction of the temple life leads to a kind of pushback from Jews, but not everybody pushes back. There's a group of people under Elizabeth Yair who put up a last stand in this place. Oops. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. In this place, Masada, you can see the second place. So it's a hilltop fortress, uh, not far from the Dead Sea in the Judean Desert. And this is where those people, and Eliza Ben Yair, around thousand people, it said, uh, who stand had the last stand, who for three years are able to uh, maintain a figment of Israeli sovereignty on this hilltop, at least. They even men tried to mint their coin. And today, with archaeological evidence, we know that they were not just fighters there. There were also a lot of refugees. So this was like a refugee camp being defended by a bunch of people. But finally, Rome strikes back. Rome comes back with power within two and a half hours, half years, not us. Times have moved so fast these days. So within two and a half years, Rome is back with its legions back. And then they destroy them. There are all these people on Masada, they die. So as we said, Jerusalem is under siege, the temple is destroyed, and the Romans even take away the menorah that was lit up every Shabbat. And yeah, this is the Masada siege. So what happens is that there's a path to reach to the top, but the defenders of the fortress, they're guarding it well. So the Romans build a ramp and they go up. But 70 years from this time, what we see is that there's a second revolt, but in between there's the revolt within the diaspora, but it is not that significant. But this in 132C, that time we see that there's the Bar Kokhba revolt, and that again. His name becomes Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba means the son of the star, but he calls himself the prince, the son of the prince. This is Masada. Today, as we see it, the fortress, you can visit it as a tourist. It's accessible and you can even see the ramp. If you see on the right side, there's some image, that's the ramp. On the left side, we have the serpentine path, which is under the sh shadow of this mountain. Today also, Maccabees and Betar, the Betar we must remember, refers to Bar Kokhba. Now, Bar Kokhba, I don't want you to get confused. Maccabees stood in the Masada Hill, and Bar Kokhba, the second revolt, that happened near Jerusalem in the Betar Mountains. That's where they put the last time and they died. So, both of them, they are popular in today's Israeli culture. There's a Tel Aviv football team, it's called Maccabi, Maccabi Tel Aviv, and the football team of Jerusalem is called Betar Jerusalem. And also, the as a health insurance, one of the major ones, like there are three big ones in Israel. One of them is called Maccabi. And the Betar influenced the youth movement of the writing under Zeev Jabotinsky. It was called the Betar. And also, before independence of Israel, Israelis had a nascent naval academy in Italy. That was also called Betar Naval Academy. As you can see, the right side, there's a fortress and some harbor that is of that, that belongs to that naval academy. And, and the small swoon or the yacht that you see. That used to be one of their training vessels. Now, the image that you see on the screen, uh, this takes us to that of Bar Kokhba. Now, what does what do you see? There is there's a parallel with the present day Israeli society. Now, back then, Bar Kokhba, he was fighting. You see, there's cavalry, there's the infantry. Today, the IDF is fighting. You have their modern cavalry, their infantry, and both kind of represent, according to the Zionist way of looking at it the same pattern. There are rustic soldiers who are willing to defend their beleaguered homeland, even though the enemy is much stronger. But the modern Zionist movement, after the formation of Israel, it doesn't take the negative consequence into account. They say, but this time we will win. This time we won't lose it. Like historically, we lost. And also, there is the Lag Baumer festival celebrated in Israel, uh, where they just burn a big bonfire, like people in Holi also in India. And we see that this is very much celebrated in Israel. It's, but you won't see it in other countries where Jews are present, like in the US or even in today's, let's say, France, where there's significant Jewish community even in other countries. But Lag Baumer is not that celebrated because what happens is that once the Zionist state comes into being, it celebrates these heroes and their past deeds. And it can the people they can in Israel can relate to what happened back then. Because Israel in the wars of 47, 48, 
67th century was Billy Good Nation. Similarly, the Hanukkah, uh, it, cel it celebrates the triumph of the Maccabees. But for much of the 2000 years of history, uh, Hanukkah was like seen as a nice spiritual moment. But once the state of Israel comes into being, Hanukkah is celebrated because the Maccabees, after they had won their, their battles, there was no oil left to light the candles in the temple. They just had enough for one day or something, but that oil lasts for eight days. It's a miracle of God. But now it is seen as more in military terms that, oh, we won the battle. Thus, we could light the lamps in our temple. And even today, there are several regiments, such as the one on the left, it's the Karakul Regiment. And they often take the oath on top of the Masada mountain. What happens in the evening, they go on a trek, they reach the summit of before dawn, and then they take the pledge when as the sun is rising. And the pledge is Masada shall never fall again. So yeah. And the coins that I was telling you. The second coin from the left, from the top, is the two shekel coin. It is the same as the Hasmonean coin, which is placed right next to it. The third coin from the top is the five agarot coin, like five cents. It, uh, it is based on the design from the Great Revolt period. And the 10 agarot coin that's right beneath it, it is also inspired by the Hasmonean coins or the Maccabee coins. On the right, if you see two big coins, uh, the golden one is the 25 agarot coin. You could call it a quarter dollar. And it is inspired from Bar Kokhva's coins that Bar Kokhva had minted. So for the next, two, much of the next 2000 years, Israel is under foreign rule. Byzantine, Persian rule, Arab rule, Fatim to Saladin, then there's the Radha Crusaders. You want to see how the Crusaders, what they were doing. A nice movie is The Kingdom of Heaven, though there is artistic exaggeration there as well. But yeah, it's a nice movie, nice entertainment. And finally, we see that at the end of Crusades, Saladin takes over Jerusalem. And we are followed by the Ottomans who rule the land. Now, once Ottomans start ruling the land of Israel, we see that there is some degree of stability, not that much warfare as it used to happen for the last 2000 years. But since the time of Crusades, there had been this rise of anti Semitism in Europe, such as blood libel, and then there were also Catholic Inquisitions. You can see there are also resources given. So if somebody wants some details on the sources of this information, just let me know after the end of the presentation. I have them saved in the comment box and I'll just copy it and paste it on the, our chat box. So anti-Jewish rights take place even during the Black Death, the Jews are blamed for the Black Death. And much of Russian empire, there's a strong deal of anti-Semitism. This is, increases especially when the Russian Empire and uh, Tsarina Katharina, she takes over uh, her part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth and it's divided up between the larger powers. The number of Jews in, within the realm suddenly increases. So they create this pale of Jews and Jews are restricted to this big landmass. It was bigger than Iran and Pakistan combined. And yet, and much of the attacks on Jews just continues unabated. And there's even a timeline of anti-Semitism it is taken from Wikipedia, though not a reliable academic source. You can use it for some sort of information and you can verify the same from peer reviewed journals and textbooks in the matter. And the Smithsonian also provides us some information of how the anti Semitism was going on in the context of poisoning of wells. Because they have this nice article where they describe the use of well poisoning in warfare throughout the 2000 years. And it also shows us how often. Jews are blamed for poisoning of wells. If you want a peer-reviewed journal article, there's this one and the sources here. But coming down to 1804, 1805, we have this term called pogrom, which is which has its etymology from uh, Russian language. But that didn't mean that pogroms didn't exist. They had existed for the last one thousand since the time of crusades. But the term pogrom used to describe it. It comes into being especially in Russia, because there are these large scale incidents. And there's also forgery in 1903, a document called the Protocol of the, Elder, Protocol of the Elders of Zion, which is a fake document created and the Jews are blamed as if they are going to take over all of the world. And it's a sad reality. But you see, this is taken from the website of the Anti-Defamation League, which is a branch of the Benai Brit uh, Zionist organization in the US. And they have given us a list of anti-Semitic groups 
Now, things get murkier with the 20th century. Uh, as it comes, we see the rise of na Nazism in Germany, and they go on a systematic mass murder using a bureaucratic method to exterminate human beings. And they go on this killing march, and you see on the right side how, to a great extent, how they reduce the Jewish populations. Europe loses two thirds of its Jews. They start in 1933 with Hitler coming to power. He enacts the enacting laws followed by the Nuremberg laws and Nuremberg laws reduces Jews first to second class citizens, then as bad as non-citizens. And then as time goes by, things get worse. There's the ghettoization and in 1938, we have the Kristallnacht when there's a pogrom, a prepared pogrom to kill as many Jews as possible. And there are similar activities taking place in Austria as well. But coming to 1941, they decide that we have to go all out. And in the 1942, one C conference, not from, from Berlin, if you have seen this, there's a new TV show uh, based on the life of ultra-Orthodox people of Israel. Uh, I'm not, I don't recollect the name well, but it's a new one. It came last three, four months. It tells the story of a girl who escapes ultra-Orthodox life, life. And she goes and she's standing next to this one C conference building. And her friend says, oh, you know, this is where the planning was made to kill the Jews. And by 1945, 6 million Jews are killed. Now, you could say that anti-Semitism led to this, but it could be one of the factors that led to all this. These things were in stoke, perhaps, because a lot of changes have happened. The enlightenment of Jews that had taken place after Renaissance led to far greater access for a particular segment of the Jewish population who now integrates into the society. They now become lawyers, professionals, and they take a part of the social life as well. They are now increasingly more visible. And thus, this leads to even further anti-Semitism because they say, because earlier the Jews were hidden. They were there, but they were hidden. So you, to be anti-Semitic, you have to find them. But now Jews are there in the public life. It is much more easier to be anti-Semitic, perhaps uh, 1500 onwards. And that's also the time when the increase of riots takes place. Now coming to the state formation, as we showed you, some segments of the state in the past. Also, we are trying to show you how the modern state is a state, but it takes inspirations from that day and era. So you all might be aware of the piece of Westphalia that gave us the concept of sovereignty. And a sovereign state, it is possible to have a sovereign state, but a sovereign state is not a full state by international law either. Because let's say you don't have recognition or you don't have diplomatic relations, then you are like a state, but not in the fullest sense. You want more. Maybe you are a full state, but you want more. You want recognition, you want embassies being exchanged. And yeah, so coming to the 19th century, towards the end of it, there's this gentleman by the name of Hudson, Theodore Hudson, uh, who sees anti Semitism firsthand. He's a famous journalist of his time. He's writing for the Free Press, one of the most renowned newspapers of the time, and he's working out of Paris. And what he sees in 1894, 96, at that time, there's this Dreyfus affair. And before that, he believed that anti-Semitism can end if we all Jews leave this religion, because then there won't be any Jews. But the Dreyfus affair, whereby a officer, military officer, Dreyfus, is blamed for spying and sabotage, though he's innocent, and he gets full blame. And Herzl sees that the reason is that he's Jewish and he's being targeted. So he looks for a way to solve this problem of anti-Semitism. And he goes on, he writes these two books. One is the Judenstadt, that is often wrongly translated as a, the Jewish state. It actually means the state of the Jews. It does what the condition is right now. And some years later, he writes this book called Alt New Land, which in German means Old New Land. The Old New Land is a reference to Israel. It is the Old New Land, the Old Land that is new at the same time. So in this book of Altmai Land, he tells us the story of a, two gentlemen who are traveling to some remote island. They pass through Israel and they get down. They see that it's impoverished. And on the way back, when they're coming back from the island to Europe, they again stop at Israel in 1923-24, in his imaginary novel. And they see that things have improved. They say it's so amazing because Jews have come and made things so much better. And then they ask a local Arab gentleman, they say, aren't you worried that Jews are taking over? And in the story, the gentleman says, why should I be? 
Today I have a job. I have a better job. We are integrated as a society. We are living in a better world today. So he understands that there are people already existing in this land, but at the same time, he doesn't believe that if the Jews come, there will be a conflict necessarily. So he, Herzl, he's the father of the Zionist movement. And he works, he doesn't, doesn't write books. He creates a movement altogether, the modern Zionist movement. He creates it as a political movement. And what happens is that uh, he, his book, it doesn't get that much um, publicity where he is. But in the Eastern Europe, there's an organization called Lovers of Zion, Lovers of Israel. They hatch, latch onto this book and they really like it. They invite him and to this first Zionist Congress to be held in Basel. Here, some few things are agreed upon that the Jews need to strengthen their unity, that they need to get together. And they also need to go to the land of Israel or any land that's available to them and start agriculture to actually lay their foundations in the land and to create a state. And for that, they would require a charter or legal document for other states. But uh, Herzl, a friend, is not a Democrat. He wants his son, Hans, the image is shown on the screen, to become the ruler. And on the right side is an image from the group Lovers of Zion. And the bottom, that's an image from the Basel conference. Herzl tries a lot. He meets the therapy of Sultan. But at the end of it, he doesn't actually succeed at getting anything. But when he was in Basel, he had written that today, when I I say I want to have, if I say I founded the Jewish state, people will laugh at me. But perhaps in 50 years, if not five years itself, there will be a state for the Jews. At that time, it's not taken that seriously. But we see that within 50 years, the state of Israel does come into being. But Herzl was just not all smoke. He did something as well. He created this newspaper, there well, no longer in existence. There's a newspaper by this name, but it is not a Jewish or Zionist newspaper. He also creates the Jewish National Fund that buys land in, in Israel or the Holy Land. He creates the Bank Lumi. Now this Jewish National Fund and Bank Lumi are still in operation. What has started back then? Alongside these, whatever Hazel is doing, there is something happening in reality in the promised land as well. The people of this faith, the Jewish people, they are moving to Israel in slow numbers. So there are five major aliyahs. You can see, this is a very important point to note, the dates. How many people are moving in which year? And we see that the biggest movement was from 1929 to 1939, because anti-Semitism and Nazism had risen in Europe, and Nazis were taking more and more territory also after 1939. And whoever could escape, they escaped. Even before that, people were escaping from Russia as well. And once the Jews start moving, there is some tension in the land of Israel itself. If you see the images on the top right, that's some European Jews coming in a ship. Below it, you see some Middle Eastern Jews. Now you might say, ah, the Jews of Europe took so much time because they had so many problems. They're finally in 20th century, they moved in. Why didn't the Jews of Middle East or the Mizrahim, why didn't they move into Israel or build their own state? Now, one of the reasons for that is that these people who live nearby, for them, Israel was not that much of an amazing place. Their home was not far. They knew how this land is because Israel is most of it is desert except for the Galil region and the regions of mountains of Judea and Samaria, there the Arabic population is very high. You can't just move in and make inroads suddenly. So the Mizrahim, they were happy in their lands in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria and Egypt. There was some degree of anti-Semitism, but it increases only in 19th and 20th century. Before that, there were occasional instances, but things were not as bad as that in Europe. And some places like Morocco, it is said that it wasn't that anti-Semitic even in 1930s. So in 1929, what happens, we see the first riots take place in Israel because the Arabs are angry that, oh, so many people are coming and they have become suspicious of the British rulers because they think maybe the British are indeed trying to create a state for the Jews. So first there is a riot in 1929, and there's also, there are also further riots in 1936-39 period. But the 29 riots, they are horrendous. People are killed in Hebron, you might know the city, the land where, the city where there are the caves of the patriarchs, where Abraham is buried, buried in such. And on the right, the image shows you 
people of Hebron who have suffered the riots. And the year 1929 is also the year that divides the Arabs and the Jews, that they have to fight against each other. The 1936 riots just reinforces that idea that, yeah, we are not safe, that we have to do something. While all this is going on, the Balfour Declaration has been done in Europe in 1970, and we'll talk about all that as well. And in response to the 1936 rights, the British Institute, the Peel Commission, under the former Secretary of State of India, and he comes up with, of course, British India, and he comes up with his report, and he says that the land needs to be partitioned. As you can see in the image on the right side, most right, the green part should be given to the Jews, the orange ones to the Palestinian Arab population, and the red part should be kept in the British rule because within the red part there is Jerusalem, but this is not just Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem, Bethlehem, the region surrounding it with all the holy sites. It would have included the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, all of that area which is very close to Christians as well, and the region of Christianity as well. And the British wanted to have all these lands. They wanted people to know when they visited these parts as, okay, you're on British territory. So yeah, but Arabs don't accept this Peel Commission report. They're angry because for them, all the land belongs to them. They want all of it because for them, they have been here for a long time and the Jews are just coming in. But what are the benefits of partition? Because if this land is divided, then the Arabs need not worry about the influx of the Jews because then they would be limited to their part of the territory. And the Jews can bring in as many as they want. They don't have to struggle to bring people in because once you have a state, you can issue a passport and a visa and you can also create a diplomatic initiatives whereby people of your faith can easily move in. And the British could say, okay, see, we may have made a promise and a Balfour declaration to give the Jews a home in the promised land. And see, we have honored our promise. But as I said, that isn't accepted. So there's a further report commission. A white paper is commissioned. And the white paper says that, okay, we need to limit Jewish immigration. 94 I guess uh, there are uh, connectivity issues. Uh, we will wait for a few moments. Dear participants, uh, let us have uh, patience. Uh, our speaker must be facing some connectivity issues. Uh, he will be back shortly. Thank you. Meanwhile, we may reflect on uh, the history of uh, Israel, which uh, speaker has just spoken on, so that uh, we may uh, well prepare to ask questions. Uh, oh, I think I lost you all. Since how, since how long have I lost you? A few moments, sir. Only a few moments. Okay, so where was I? Which part? Where should I continue it from? Uh, uh, you are you are supposed to share your slides. I think it is not visible now. Okay, just give me a second. So, uh, what, have you were you able to see this part? 
Uh, yes, that one, that one we saw. Maybe next one. Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, this one. No, no, no. Before, before, before that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what happens is that the Peel Commission report it calls a partition of the lands. Uh, it had been instituted in 1936, and it comes out with its report in 1937. This is Mr. Peel, who used to be the Secretary of State for British India. And it was held in response to the 1936 riots. And once the riots happen, the Peel Commission goes and tells that we can partition this land into two parts, one for the Jews, one for the Arabs, and Jerusalem, Bethlehem, the holy sites, and along with the small passageway all the way to Jaffa, the port, it will stay under British rule. The Arabs are totally against it. They don't like it. They say, all this land belongs to us. It's ours anyway. But the Jews are happy because for the first time in their history, they have been offered a homeland. No matter how small it is, as they say, half a loaf is better than no bread. So yeah, they are kind of happy. Even though this land that you see, it is almost less than 22% of the land of Israel. It's very small, but still they accept it because now they can admit as many Jews into this king, into the state. And the British also get to save their face. They can say that, see, we have kept our promise that we had made in 1970 under the Balfour Declaration. So now we'll go back a bit in time to 1917. But before we do that, we must look at the context in which it is happening. Uh, so what happens is that, yeah, the British, they had been in talks with the Sheriff of Mecca the guardian of the holy site of Mecca, the holy mosque, and uh, also the Kaaba. And he promises them, the British promise the sheriff lands, countries. They promise him Jordan and even Syria to some extent. And the sheriff of Mecca is glad to rebel against his Ottoman overlords who have kept him in check. And for the first time, he's being offered a country. So he's happy to take it. And for the British, this was very important because otherwise the Ottomans, just give me a second, there's some noise. I will just settle the noise part. Yes. Is my slide visible? Yes, it is. It is. OK. Yeah. So what happens is that the uh, the sheriff and his family, they decide to join the British side because they are going to get a nice piece of territory with their own country. And the British are also free now because now the Ottomans can't just say that this is a war between the believers and the infidel. And it's much easy for the British to get to recruit Muslims and to also ensure that it is not seen, the war is not seen in sectarian terms during World War I. But also the British have made some agreements with the French under the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Now, Mark Sykes is a French diplomat and, oh, sorry, a British diplomat. And Pico is a French diplomat. And in 1915, in the winter of 1915, all the way to the early 1916, these two diplomats sit down and they decide to carve up Middle East between the British and the French. And this is a funny factoid that some say that when this boundary on the right screen, if you can see, there's a blue line. Uh, I don't know if it's true or it's just a funny joke or it's an urban legend. Uh, they say that in Egypt, one of the British secretaries was apparently too drunk that day. And so his finger was shaking a little bit. That's why wherever the finger shakes to the right end is because it's an effect of alcohol. And that's how the boundaries in much of Orient for them uh, these lands to which they didn't, the white men didn't belong, they were happy to divide it as per their wishes. And it's very important to understand the sites because, because this not just divides the land, when the, when the children of Sheriff of Mecca, they tried to claim the area A that I'm showing you on the right side screen, the French are angry. The French say, no way, this is our land, the British have promised it to us. So the British had made multiple promises to multiple parties and now they are supposed to keep those promises. Finally, the French fight one of the children of the sheriff, Fazil, and Fazil is defeated and he has to retreat. But Jordan is prof offered to Prince Abdullah, the son of the sheriff of Mecca. And when he is about to defend his brother's rights in Syria by war, the British convince him to not do that because they will give Fazil another piece of territory. That you can see on the right map, there's some pink where my cursor is moving. 
that's Mesopotamia, Iraq. So they offer Faisal, Iraq. So Faisal one creates the monarchy in Iraq and Abdullah creates the monarchy in Jordan. So both these were two Hashemite kingdoms of the children of Sheriff of Mecca. But at the same time, the Sheriff faces trouble in his own, own lands of Hejaz around Mecca. The South family, which today rules Saudi Arabia, they rebel against them. So while the Sheriff is rebelling against the Ottomans with British support, we see that the Sauds are also trying to fight out against the Sheriff. So while the Sheriff and his family get Iraq and Jordan, they lose the Hejaz part of Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia comes up there. His two sons, Abdullah and Faisal. And in this context, we should see the Balfour Declaration of 1917. So on the left side, if you see, that's the letter that Lord Balfour had written to Lord Rothschild. And now Lord Rothschild, he's saying, if you go through this line, uh, Dr. Anirudha, can you see my cursor, mouse cursor? Yes, yes, it is, it is yeah. there. We can see, yeah. yeah, so you see, establishment in Palestine of a national home. So does it mean all of Palestinian territories or some part in Palestine? It is not saying establishment when all of Palestine it says establishment in Palestine. So it can be interpreted in multiple ways. And also the Palestine back then was this big chunk of territory. This was the initial mandate of Palestine in 1917 when this letter was written. And this man, not 19, this mandate was given around 1919 after the formation of the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is the organization that gives the mandate. But then the British in 1920, during the time of San Remo Conference, they divided along the Jordan River. Left side of the Jordan River is now the New Palestine, and the right side is called Transjordan because this is the Jordan River in between. So Transjordan, across Jordan. So some in the Jordanian ruling house, they say, we the promo promised Palestine, we should get the left as well. But some in the Jewish right wing say, we were promised Palestine. And they even had a slogan, the right wing, like today, the party that rules Israel, not exactly ruling, but Netanyahu is from the right wing Likud party. And his predecessor, the Kadima, before that, there was another party, uh, another right wing party. And all these right wing parties are inspired by the ideology of Zeev Jabotinsky, Menachem Begin, his air, political air, and they had a slogan, I will have land on this side of river as well as on that side of the river. Because Palestine back then used to be big, but the British divided up, making it convenient to keep two promises because they are promised almost the same land, you might say. And also, if you read the letter, if you have been reading till now, while I was describing it, you would see that it says that from the bottom, if you see, it's the fifth or sixth line. The religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine shall be defended. So they are anyway saying that the existing population can stay there and it's all fine. But you see, things don't always go as planned in wars. And the, yeah, this 1920 San Remo conference happens, all that I just explained now. And yeah, the right side, left side is the document by the League of Nations granting the mandate of Palestine. But by the time this proper mandate comes, the British slip in the Article 25 within it stating the partition of this land. Now, I have just left one part in this discussion. When the 1936 strikes take place, I told you first there was the Peel Commission report, but it is disregarded by the Arab population, their leadership, the AJC. And what happens is that there's another report drafted by the British, because the Woodhead Commission says that this Peel Commission is not implementable. It's not acceptable to the majority population because Arabs still, up till that time, were majority in all the land between Mediterranean Sea and the River Jordan. And the white paper that comes out as a result, published in 1939, says that the immigration of Jews would be restricted. It's kind of pandering to the Arab population because they need their support. Because if you may ask why, the Jews can't be supporting the Axis powers in World War II. Hitler is killing Jews. On the other hand, the Arab side can decide which side to go with, even though it, they might not implement it on the ground, but politically they may decide. Similarly, the leader of the Palestinians, Haj al-Amin Hussein, he sides with Hitler. And during the World War II, he's in Germany getting a nice salary. And even one of his generals, I think it was Abdul Qadir al-Husseini, 
not sure about the second name but yeah one of his leading generals was also had a rank in the german army the wehrmacht and so after the 1939 white paper report which is implemented jews cannot legally move into israel after 1939 23 may and there are illegal movements through clandestine boat movements or charters but the british are blocking these ships and this is also the time when many other countries refuse to accept jewish refugees now after the world war 2 ends there is this land still and the league of nation has to be replaced by the united nations and the british say in 1946 that they would be leaving these lands and the un decides on a plan to partition so what it does it sends a un scope united nations special committee on palestine to visit these lands and they go ahead and prepare a booklet called and they have chapters and they have a report and in that report what happens is that they are they come up with two plans we'll just talk about one of those one of the plans is put to vote and finally that plan you can see on the right side these are the members of un who are going out and talking to the jews and arabs the arabs in fact initially boycott them but secretly several arabs they go and talk to them and they put forth their views and what they want now once this resolution is brought in it is brought in as resolution 181 first but when it is passed it is passed as 1812 with some modifications now it says that the land can be partitioned along these lines if you see on the map so there are jewish population that will live in the blue and the palestinian population that will live in orange dr anirudha am i audible you can see everything yes 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 no problem okay so you see on top where my mouse cursor is that's supposed to be an interchange like a four way road like right? the road there are four the crossroads so the jewish population from the left to right can move and the palestinian population from north to south can move similarly gaza and west bank were to have a kissing point and the jews could move from north to south and arabs could move from west to east again but this is not acceptable to the arab side because they say that all of this land belongs to us we can have all of it so they summarily reject it but it is put to vote in the un general assembly it clears with 33 votes and in november november 29 un says that let there be a state the jewish population the zionist population is overjoyed for the first time in the last 2000 years they are being offered sovereignty a state a land where they are not foreign foreigners or a land where the law won't suddenly change and say that send all the jews to the ghettos or where the ruler would suddenly be, take steps to pander to the majority to kill jews so first first time they have this segment of security that we are secure finally we can live like any other people and also hertzl back in the time when he had he was coming with his theories one of the reasons he gave for why jews are being hunted and killed everywhere is that he says that maybe it's because we are still alive we are still existing why are we still there so a people they were but a people without a land finally they are being promised the land when this proposal comes in us south supports it the us department of state doesn't exactly support it but and the british government doesn't support it either and in fact the opposition of british government is the reason one of the reasons why stalin wants to support the jewish state and also the founders of the state the zionists they lived in kibbutz and the communists in soviet union so oh, people who live in kibbutz just like our communes people who have socialist way of thinking and looking at things and they believe that these people will anyway go towards society that is something along the lines of soviet union there there were a lot of marxists as well among the zionists but what happens is that the arabs don't like it and on november 38 1947 while jews are celebrating the arab side which has summarily rejected the un proposal to partition the land there are attacks on jews in several places and the jewish side knew that the zionists side knew that there will be attacks and they had also made some preparations but nothing was enough because they were not a state till that they will we must understand from 30th november 1947 till may of 1948 it's still the british mandate 
that's going on. The British are still the overlords, but they have made their mind to leave. So a civil war starts. The civil war can be divided in two phases from November 30th, 1947 to March 31st of 1948, the next year. The first phase, what happens is that uh, the Jews are losing, you might say, in the first of these months. And they try their best to defend themselves, but even they are not well prepared because without a state, they, they did have self-defense forces like the Haganah, and they had militias like the Palmak or the Irgun and Lehi. But the Irgun and the Lehi were not under the control of the government of this pre-state entity called the Yishu. Now you might say, what is the Yishu? So I'll take you back to the slide where the Aliyah is taking place. You see these Aliyahs? All these people who come to Israel over those several years and Tel Aviv, the city of Tel Aviv is formed around 1919. It is created and built by the people who come in the second and the third wave of, wave of immigration. And when they come here, they form their proto-state structures. And this form of governance is called the issue. It has its own security called the Hashumer. It later on that builds its own militia called the Haganah, which sometimes stays underground, sometimes it cooperates with the British rulers. And this issue is the one which is fighting for the existence and the state that is going to come. But to ensure that they are still alive and the state of Israel is formed, they have to fight. So in the first phase, they lose. And what the Arabs under the AJC, uh, under Hajjal, Husseini, Khawagji, what they do is that they ensure that Jewish settlements are cut off. So the roads that are connecting the cities and towns of Jewish, major Jewish populations, those roads are where they put up their guns and gunmen, and they engage in sort of guerrilla warfare. And they do it pretty well in the first phase because the Jewish side has armored cars, the Arab side doesn't have. But the armored cars are battered. In fact, in the first phase, uh, the Zionist, the Yishuv, they kind of lose all of the armored cars. And they are almost on the verge of losing, one might say. But they don't give up. And the kibbutz, which are which have been created all these years, are placed in the frontier areas. And the kibbutz men and the kibbutz women, they are like farmers, they are doing their work. They also carry a gun with them and they defend themselves. But by the second stage, when it's April of 1948, there's a new stage and a defensive plan or a plan D is put into place. It's also called Plan Dalit, the Hebrew character for D, that makes it sound D. And for that, they say that, okay, we will be more offensive in certain areas and certain areas we will not interfere. And in the second phase, the Haganah took the initiative and in six weeks, the tables have turned. One of the major reasons for this turning of tables is also because there are a lot of volunteers from Europe and United States who come in to fight to defend the issue. And there are all these people who are coming to join them with experience, with military experience. Many of them have fought in the World War II and they know how things work out. They bring with them the knowledge of using communication, radios, and even some rudimentary radars. And much of those early Israeli innovation and military technology is based on this. These people bring in that new, or how do you say? And also many of them are not Jews, yet they are fighting. And you could say the immigration also suddenly increases after 1945. And a lot of these immigrants are young, able-bodied people who can fight, who can pick up weapons. So in the phase two, from April 1st to May 14th, the tables turn and Israel kinds of sweeps up and they defeat large numbers. And you see the gun on the left, it's a mortar. The Arab side didn't even have mortars. This mortar that the Jews used, it was a very good one. It's called the David Cup. If you visit Israel in Jerusalem from the old city along the Jaffa Road, you can see a model of it. It's called the David Cup Square. And there's David Cup place. It wasn't accurate, but it made a lot of noise. It was good at scaring the enemies. On the right side, it's not a tank. It's an armored car that was used. The person on the leftmost is Hajjal Amin Husseini. And on the rightmost and the middle one are his generals the people who fought for him. But there were always some tussle even within the Arab camp. They were not always cooperating. There were several militias. For instance, Hajjal Husseini had his own army and he wanted weapons to go to them. And the other militiamen, they wanted weapons to go to them. There were also this the family photo that you see on the leftmost top. They are the Nashashibis. They were rivals to our Husseini clan. 
And there were these rivalries, and there are also several Arab and Bedouin clans who prefer to support the Jews because they have all scores to settle. And the bottom most picture, you see the gentleman in the middle, he's a Druze, this gentleman. So the Druze at first were fighting from the Arab side, but when they lose to the Jews in some of the battles, and they want the safety of their families, their villages, they join the Jews because they understand that the Jews are going to win perhaps, or maybe they have a change of heart and they decide that this is the side we are going to stick with. And even till today, the Druze in Israel are loyal and patriotic citizens of Israel. And we see that along with Landy, what happens is that uh, in several places, there were offensive strikes. One of the most important ones that we can look at is that in Deir Yassin. The right side image shows you the village of Deir Yassin. So what happens is that I told you about the two militias, Irgun and Lehi, Lehi. So they attack, I think it is Irgun that attacks this village, but they didn't expect any opposition, any resistance. But when they are going and they just make a declaration, kindly surrender, get down, leave the village, we are taking over, something along those lines. Instead, there are there is bullet sprays from those houses in the village. And a lot of the men lose lives and they decide to avenge it and they go house to house, throw in grenades and even get people out and they even kill several people, they spray bullets and there's something of a massacre. And this becomes like a, how do I say it? For the Palestinians, it was like, oh, they have killed and killed main so many of us. And the people who leave this village and go to Jerusalem, they then tell them, see, we were killed. And the Jewish commission and the Arab, their high command, they decide that the Arab leadership decides that we are going to make maximum of it. And we are make, going to ensure that everybody knows that what happened. But they tend to exaggerate. Similarly, the Jewish side wants this exaggeration to go on, to show that, yes, we were ruthless. And yes, because the message then goes out to others that the Jews are going to, they are fighting hard. And you better leave. And it's not good to pick a fight with them. So in the civil war, this incident also leads to the Jews winning many battles because the Arab side just recedes. They just withdraw because they think, oh, we might as well lose. And also, before this happened, the Arab side was always on the withdrawal because many of the Arab states, the Arab League, and they all said that, see, the Arab people, you just come move away. Our soldiers and the militiamen will go and wipe out the Jews. Once all Jews are killed or they leave, then we can go back and we can take back the lands, our Arab lands. So the forces of the issue of state, you can see there's a chronological order of the formation. So during World War I, also several Jewish people, they joined the Jewish Legion under Ziv Jabotinsky, who later on was one of the founders of Irgun, the militia. And also 1941, another militia out of the Irgun arises called Lehi because they want to leave the Irgun and create their own. And the Lehi members used to call their members terrorists. We are terrorists. And Yitzhak Shamir, one of the future rulers of Israel, was a Lehi member. And uh, the British had even come out with a poster of him as a terrorist. And during Oslo and all that, when the PLO was fighting with the Israeli government in 1980s, in one of those meetings, the Palestinian side shows one of the posters. See, it is not us who is the terrorist, it's you who are the terrorist. Because they show a poster of Yitzhak Shamir as terrorist wanted. And yeah, so the leftmost is the Bereka batch of the Jewish Legion. The second one is the logo of the Jewish Brigade, which fights in the World War II. So these are Jewish people formed in 1944 who fought with the British. And so they get a lot of training. But the first Jewish Legion is very influential and it's revolutionary because in 1917, when the Jews first fight in World War II, as wearing a menorah on their hat, it is a statement that, yeah, Jews are fighting as Jews. And many of the people who come out of this war as hardened men with military training, they lay the foundation of Haganah, the defense, which then goes on to form the Israeli army, the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces. And even the name, today's name of the IDF in Hebrew, it's Zohar Haganah La Israel. So there's the Haganah word, Israel Defense Force. So the Palmach is formed in 1941. It is more like a more egalitarian army, uh, like a crack troop, and the Palmach, they are formed, and they don't salute usually, but Later on, they are assimilated. But see, during all this time, the issue of government was very clear that the government is the one who is supreme. We can't have so many ragtag armies. So once when Irgun had come up with the ship called Altalina and they had brought a lot of weapons, 
and they were just trying to bring in all those weapons to Israel and the Haganah under the leadership of the future Ben Gurion, the leader of Israel, he, the future leader, they say, you stop there. You give us all the weapons and then we'll talk. But they say, no, we'll first bring in the weapons, then we'll talk. So Haganah under the order of Ben Gurion, they blow up the ship, even though it's bringing valuable weapons. This happens in June of 1948. So yeah, there's the kibbutz movement also because of which all this happens. And the earliest kibbutz had started as the Deganya in near the lake of Kalili, Lake Kinneret, upon which Jesus had walked upon. So yeah, the kibbutz movement, pro they were like eight to 10% of the Jewish population, but they were like the elite. Ben Gurion was himself from a kibbutz as well. And yeah, this is how it goes. From 1946 to 2000, this is how the Jewish expansion begins. So this third map on the left, this is instrumental for us. It shows us how Israel becomes a state after 1948, War of Independence. We haven't discussed it today. We have just spoken to the formation of Israel, the civil war period. And in the next lecture, perhaps, or webinar, we'll talk about it. So any questions? I'm kind of done for my part. And I look forward to hear from you. Uh Mr. Jyoti, thank you so much. I mean, I was uh, really lost uh, in your uh, presentation because uh, this is something that uh, I believe that uh, people should really know because there are so many misconceptions, uh, you know, woven around this particular topic. You know, uh, theological aspects are there, uh, religious aspects are there, political aspects are there, even the international law also plays an important role in understanding the entire whole lot of situation. See, uh, the state formation is a different thing and the nation formation is again different thing so when we think about the evolution of the jewish nation and its culmination into the state i think uh, we have to really uh, understand uh, distinctly and uh, you have given uh, complete justice uh, to your presentation and this uh, wonderful topic now i uh, open this floor uh, for questions please uh, please go ahead and uh, shoot your questions Thank you. Yes, uh, I guess uh, we were. Yeah, please turn on your on. mic and you can read out your questions. Uh, uh, yes, yes, that that would be great. Uh, uh, Avive, can you can you just uh, turn on your mic? We would really like to, like you to ask this question. Please go ahead. Uh, sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, congratulations, Jyoti. Yeah, it was very informative and insightful presentation. So uh, the question that I would like to put across is uh, maybe not directly related to your, uh, I mean, like within the scope of your discussion. However, I just want to uh, like, you know, brought about this question out of my curiosity. Uh, well, uh, sociologists use the example of kid boots of Israel to be the most egalitarian society in the world. So how could you highlight how egalitarian it is when it comes to gender? Okay. So, to be honest, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that, but I'll make an attempt. So in the earlier days, what we see is that uh, in relative terms, it is way ahead of its time, you may say, because in kibbutz, women are not restricted. Okay, just a second. Okay, yeah. So in kibbutz, basically many women are not restricted. Many of them find freedom for the first time. And it is perhaps not because they are women, but because they are part of the kibbutz. So just by belonging to the kibbutz, many of them are able to move up. Because even today, if you go to Israel, the kibbutz system is no longer as socialistic as it used to be back in the day. But even today, the salary difference between someone who is, let's say, at the bottom of the pyramid, and let's say someone who is the director of a company, because today many of the kibbutz, they run steel, small steel forgings. Like in India, we can buy some weaponry, like right from Israel, a lot of the weaponry. So some of the weaponry, the missiles bottom part, the marriaging steel is made in a kibbutz, a small kibbutz factory. And the director of the kibbutz, his salary difference compared to let's say someone who's a small mechanic or someone whose job is to ensure the cleanliness of the premises, that salary difference is not like say in any other capitalistic society. And, and back in the day, when you must be honest, women, under the patriarchal system, we're kept backward, we can say on purpose. And Jews, even though enlightened Jews, they had a different life. But not all Jews were enlightened. The enlightenment process 
created some Jews who were enlightened. And they then, we can't say they were the ones who came in and created the kibbutz because most of the initial kibbutznik, like Ben Gurion, were from the Russian Empire, we can say. And many of them were from Central Europe also. But the ideas were ahead of their time. And yeah, women kind of get pay. They also get education. And they also get to serve in the military. Now, while it, serving in the military may not be seen as a feministic tendency, uh, it might be seen as more empowering because when in a society the men have guns and you don't have guns, you are creating one more layer of difference. But many of the I might have a picture of the same as well. Let me just see in my slide if I have keyboards. Yeah. So you see this. Okay, let me put the present. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Avive, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. it's showing up. Yeah, yeah. It's showing up. yeah, yeah I could yeah. see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The left bottom, you see, these are the kibbutz people. In this image, there are men and women. You can see some girls holding guns. Can you see the young girls holding guns? Yes, yes, I could. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, but to be honest, uh, that cannot be the sole way of looking at where the progress has been made. Of course, uh, there is gender difference. And even in Israel society today, there are a lot of movement for gender equality and there is a lot of progress to be made. But for their time and in their society, because the moment we look at Israel, uh, the Israeli side, or uh, even many other people will say, then the comparison should be made with the neighborhood. And they will compare you with, ask you to compare Israel with Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. And if you want to look at a comparison of Jewish society and Egyptian society, I say Egyptian society because back in the time, uh, Egypt had the University Al-Azhar. It was seen as the high ground of Arab civilization. That's where Nasser came up from. And there's a movie called the Jacobian House. And there's even a book of that name, House of Jacobia. If you watch it, it shows how the Egyptian society is. And the Israeli society, because so much of the time their immediate enemy or the biggest threat was Egypt, they compared their society with them. And they said, see, our society is at least much better. And then kibbutz, what happened is that uh, the children, they don't get to make the gender difference pass. Because once you are a kid, uh, you, the kids, they are not sleeping with their parents. They have their own small kindergarten where all the kids sleep and there are people allotted the job of taking care of kids. So they are growing up. There is less a sense of gender compared to some other society where they grow up in a family. And also as they grow up, uh, this, uh, at, I think at the teenage level, they get their own rooms in a small colony or a housing area within the kibbutz where the teenagers can live their own life and the parents cannot interfere. So the ability of parents to impose the, impose the pre-existing culture or pre-existing gender difference upon the new generation is, of course, it is reduced to a great extent. And uh, the kibbutz people, originally the Zionist socialists, they were not very religious. And uh, recently a TV series has come up called The Valley of Tears. It shows uh, the 1973 war, I guess, yeah. It shows, yeah, it shows the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And it shows a girl from kibbutz. She doesn't believe in God. She is free to marry whomever she wants. Uh, she decides to marry a man from Tunisia, Mizrahi. Now, in Israeli society, there were used to be this racial difference for the much of the early 30 years, 40 years, because the elite were the Ashkenazim from Europe who had migrated from there. And the Jews of Middle East, who were of a little bit darker skin, and even Jews of India, when they went there, they were seen as the Mizrahim. And they were seen as not sophisticated, maybe not advanced enough, not educated enough. And there's a differentiation. And in this TV series, Valley of Tears, it is shown that there's a girl who lives in a kibbutz and she's free to leave her Ashkenazim boyfriend and go for a boy who is from Tunisia originally. But the guy says during one of the conversations with another person, it is very difficult for me to see that she could accept me because you know where we live, where we live, our houses are like ghettos and slums and she's a kibbutznik. She doesn't even believe in God. How do I take her to my parents? What will they think? So those who live in kibbutz, they have a very egalitarian life or society compared to other sections of Israel, Israeli society, as well as in the neighboring area. I know I have not answered the question, but I have made an attempt. 
Thank you very much, Jyoti. Uh, in fact, you have answered almost everything that I really expected from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Uh, thank you, Aviva, for your uh, uh, interesting question and also equally interesting answer. So I, I now see Aviva now inspired me to ask another question from sociological perspective. Uh, perspective, and my uh, question would be: You you know the the history of uh, the Jewish people has always been you know full of swings, up and downs, violence, brutality, success, failures. You know. So basically, you know, when you look at the Jewish population, right, uh, we also recognize the contribution that has been made by them uh, to the world at large, especially the science and technology, mathematics, uh, physics, and uh, you know, the other sciences. Now, uh, here my question is that, that considering uh, the kind of uh, history that uh, the Jewish population has, their contribution uh, right from the ancient world uh, to, the, to the medieval and the, down to the modern world, right? So how does the Jewish population look at themselves? Because see, on one hand, they have Ashkenazi Jews, then they have, uh, you know, the Bene Israelis from India, okay? And uh, there are, what my observation since uh, you know uh, i have uh, some people you know in my family got married into the jewish community so i know that very well that they are very liberal people very sweet people those who have suffered a lot historically but at the same time there are some issues which is going on you know since time memorial in 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 their communities as well so as a uh, as an independent observer right uh, who has done a participative research uh, in the field so how do you observe these social dynamics, you know? And uh, don't you think that uh, something really needs to be done to, you know, to breach the gaps uh, that has been created by those notions, the specific notions and uh, the understanding that comes with a notion? What do you think about it? Uh, I understood that enlightened, Jew enlightened Jews and them having scientific achievements. I can answer that. And the second question I could understand Done. Are you talking about the differences within the society, within the Jewish yes, community? Yes, yes, very also? much. Yeah, 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 very much. Because the more you penetrate their society, since you have done a participative research, you lived among them. You must be having friends also. You must have lived yeah. in their houses as well. Yes. So definitely, this must have occurred to you. You must have observed that. Because I personally observed that. So that is why I really want to know your view on that, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so for the first question, I'll give you, I'll try to give a nice answer. And the second one, I'll try to give a more anecdotal and less of a social scientific database answer. So the first, I would say that the enlightenment of Jews started after the enlightenment revolution of Galileo, Darwin and all that. That was the time when some Jews had an, decided that rather than just following the religion, we'll also live like, a human being should live and try to explore our maximum potential and to reach our greatest. We'll ensure that whatever we have, we'll try to explore it to our greatest extent. So some of the Jews in Central and Western Europe, not that much in Eastern Europe, they go on this path of enlightenment. What happens is that there's the saying, be a Jew at your home and be a goy outside. So when you're outside, you be you are a scientist. You be a good scientist. You are a lawyer. You be a good lawyer. You are a professor. You be a good professor. You are a workman. You are a goldsmith. You be a goldsmith. And when you see you are in home, then okay, you are now a Jewish person and you fulfill all the duties accordingly. And many of these Jewish people uh, who come from this enlightenment, they were not a big chunk of the Jewish society also. They were not the entirety of the Jewish society also. It was one section. And this one small section, I think they've contributed more than one fourth of all the Nobel prizes. Prizes, like th their overall population in the world might be less than 0.001 percent, but they have taken more than quarter of Nobel prizes in the world. That's because of what we call the rise of scientific and political freedom. Now, we believe that uh, in any society, you give people scientific freedom. That's enough. Uh, not exactly so. Why? There is scientific freedom in many autocratic countries also. Uh, in an autocratic country, you can study engineering, you can study physics. And in fact, those governments will even encourage you. They will say, study science, physics, and all this, because then the people cannot oppose the government. There's nothing 
there's no content that they are reading in everyday life which tells them that the state is oppressive or something or it tells them that the look at the those who are ruling they have taken up all the resources there's nothing in those disciplines that tells them but if you just go on that mode of development there's a limit to which you can reach uh, but if you have political freedom then only you'll be able to have scientific freedom in a way because once you have political freedom total freedom of course i'm not just saying just having political freedom is enough you need to have both and once you have the political freedom you can think out loud you can do as you may then you can prosper more so the enlightened jews because they lived in a part of the world but despite the anti-semitism of that era see the anti-semitism was there but it increased more in 18th and 19th century in eastern europe in western europe it was there but there's also a gradient right where it is more where it is less and when you are rich uh, it affects you less and many of the enlightened jews they become rich also and but there's also we have a stereotype that jews are it's a racist stereotype one may even say because the moment we categorize people as good or bad or anything that means we are sanctioning that categorizing is acceptable and so yeah but the reason why jews are some jews are able to do well is because they accept the scientific and political freedom so even today in us or even in uk you'll find a lot of intellectuals amazing intellectuals who happen to be from jewish parentage or who happen to be from jewish origin it is because they have this great sense of freedom and also even if you take out the freedom component aside the conservative part also jewish religion has this uh, debating culture like uh, we once went along with a class to the house of an orthodox family very rich orthodox we asked them so how much someone asked them what's what about the wealth and money because you are so many people living he just pointed out towards his library of books and said this is my wealth i don't need anything else and they're conservative people and also uh, there's this talmudic debate system right because once the jews were exiled uh, after the destruction of the second temple there is no temple to worship at so it's more like a congregation like thing they have synagogues and they have they have scrolls they're writing and debating and discussing and during the second temple period also uh, right after the temple was broken even after that uh, there's this academy in yavne in israel where the sages and all they are able to get some they tell the rule, ruling romans like see please don't destroy us don't kill us we just want to do our discussion and religious discussion so there is this tendency to discuss debate to learn that is there and once you have political and scientific freedom i think then there is first of all you have the skill and now there's no limitation to use deploy that skill of course this is very stupid of what i'm saying it's not an exact answer but yeah i i put the onus on the scientific and political freedom that they have thus they're able to achieve this also in the technion the most important engineering science technological university in israel is built uh, the some many of the academics say okay so the language of instruction should be german because all the german jews are coming they will teach they'll teach in german or maybe even english but the native movement language movement say no the language of instruction should be hebrew they said how can we teach scientific stuff in hebrew we'll need to create a new jargon in hebrew altogether but they said no make it hebrew or else no the course won't go ahead so finally technion starts with hebrew medium education and well we don't know whether back then what they were thinking but now we know that physics and chemistry can be done in hebrew because many of the professors who are teaching today in technion they have nobel prizes they are nobel laureates and they are teaching in technion university and they are scientists chemistry so we do know that chemistry and physics can be done in hebrew so it is not about language it is about scientific and political freedom you set the people free let them take care of themselves but also the surrounding circumstances matter to a great extent and regarding the discrimination part so yeah so how do we say this during the much of the first 30 40 years um the elite where the lab uh, and the ruling party of israel was the labor party and the majority it was dominated by the ashkenazim and when the mizrahim the jews from the arab world they come in uh, at first they have a very bad life because 
they don't speak the language english or hebrew and they speak arabic and in 1950s and 60s arabic is considered the language of the enemy who is about to kill you so there is double discrimination and there is one more tv series that i mentioned here <laughs> there is a new tv series called the spy which are not new anymore it shows the story of ali cohen who is a spy and it takes you back to those days of 50s and 60s it shows that ali cohen goes to a party with his wife and his wife's boss's husband he asks him hey can you get us some wine thinking that he's a servant because he is brown skin and maybe misrais are not good enough to be the to rise up but see this is an exaggeration of reality maybe but there was such a reality where the misrahim faced discrimination when they came first came in they had very bad living conditions uh, they faced discrimination in everyday life as well but with the coming of time uh, what happens is in israel every person has to do the military service and it has been there like that especially for men women do it for 2 years wasn't always compulsory and once you go in the military the first thing you do is you learn hebrew language so it becomes a melting pot so the youngsters 17 18 years old they get into the army for 3 years and the nation is actually formed you might say in the army there in the idf and this breaks many barriers so today the level of racial discrimination is almost very 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 low but yes we do see demonstrations like say from the ethiopian jewish community who have in recent years been protesting that they need better rights and also this discrimination of mizrahim has reduced almost to very to great extent because today the mizrahim they form the majority or the shafadi along the shafadi and the mizrahim shafadi are the jews who were expelled in the spanish inquisition from spain and many of them are from turkey because many of them left spain and went to turkey some and north africa and mizrahis and the shafadim they form the majority if you put them together and consider all of them as colored jews then they form the majority and the ruling party of israel for 2 3 years ago because last 2 3 years has been election after election after election uh, used to be likud and likud is supported has support in these uh sections of society the ashkenazim on the other hand uh they are liberals very liberal you can say some of them still have supported the labor party because the labor party is a socialist liberal party and the likud is seen as a little bit right wing uh do you want me to uh, go further or answer anything further on uh, no 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 thank you thank you i mean uh, the kind of dynamics you have ex- expressed you know that is very true it's a ground reality of uh, ever evolving uh, you know jewish uh, society so thank you so much for that uh is there any other question uh, maybe uh, a- a- anyone i mean from a theological angle also we can take up from biblical aspect also if uh, anybody uh, wishes to raise any point Mm, okay uh, one more question from my side uh well uh, what is your view about uh, the living and development of uh, uh indian uh, jewish people in israel specifically from bombay who have migrated from bombay the, who has mother tongue marathi you know they are living there they are prospering there but uh, uh, what is your observation how are they living i mean are they happy are they equally contributing uh, to the political and uh, uh, you know the economic growth of the nation are they getting good opportunities there what is your take on it so i don't have a social scientific answer but yeah anecdotally yes so i have met people like just walking into uh, for instance i was walking through the beach of caesarea or caesarea and uh, I, what happens is that i'll show you on the map i'll yeah maybe it is delving away from the answer but yeah it's an interesting thing yeah okay now i'm going to click on the present button just let me know once you can see the screen okay uh, can you see the screen uh, yeah it's coming up here yeah. okay so yes, you yes. see right now i'm looking at caesarea it's a small city like a private city uh not far from the north of israel and i was walking past this beach once and i saw these structures they tend to cut off you see the structure on the beach can you see it little bit off the beach this one yes 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 so it is like invisible. a wall like thing in the middle of the water uh so i asked the gentleman there like 
there's a beach and in India we have beach which is open to the sea but in Israel once in the middle of the water there is a small embankment like thing I'm trying to find a good one where it is very evident so yeah so the person replies to me in Hindi I'm shocked okay. I asked him because you are shocked because uh, so he says he answers me he tells that oh it is to prevent kids from been taken away by the tide, the currents. So, and he explains it to me pretty well. So I asked him, ah, but how do you speak Hindi? And he says, Meri maa Bombay se hai. So right, he says right, that his yes. mother is from Mumbai. And I couldn't tell the difference when I meet an Israeli Jewish uh, or an in person from India. The fact that I cannot tell the difference between an Indian Jewish person and the non-Indian Jewish person, I think the discrimination is not as hard today. But in the early days of state formation, 47, 48, there was discrimination. Many from the Bene Israel who left from Mumbai, Pune, this area, many of them returned back. And their complaint was that it's very difficult to adjust to that life. And also, I, as I mentioned earlier, there was some discrimination, much more discrimination in the early days. Today, it is much less. And many of the people in India, Indian Jews, have seen that they have worked in India in the corporate sector, they are 30, and then they take a chance and they move there. And uh, there was time, uh, right now there's election hearing going on, right, in Israel. And then there's a party led by Shalit, just a second, I forget her name. Mm, yeah. Uh, there is a party led by Naftali Bennett. And Naftali Bennett, and there's, just give me a second, I want to find the exact name and let you know. So there's this politician and she had an event and you might say that the Indian Jewish population, especially the Bene from Maharashtra, Gujarat, that area. And one of them rose up and he asked the question. Now they constitute a very small population of Israel, very small, very tiny. Yet it's not that they are totally invisible. You can see them and they are there for you to see. and. Of course, they might not have prospered as much as we have, might have wanted. For instance, many of the major industries and all of that, uh, you might not find that many Indian owners, Indian entrepreneurs, or even in politics. But if you look at their life, you can say that they are living as good as any other Jewish person. But yeah, there's scope for improvement. A lot of them are concentrated around the towns of Ramle, I think. And yeah, there are Indians in... Dimona as well, and also south of Tel Aviv, there are cities of Rishon Lezion, Ulon, Batyam. There are significant Indians living there. Also, there are settlements like there's the Bene Menashe tribe as well, and they are living in some settlements and they're also living in the north. So, yeah. Do you want me to elaborate on any particular point regarding this? If I haven't answered that part, you can ask. Uh, no, 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 not at all. The purpose of uh, you know raising this question is so that the people will be enlightened. Right, because uh, this entire talk is being recorded, it will be broadcasted on YouTube, and uh, somewhere I personally feel that uh, people have uh, people do not have uh, much knowledge about the Jewish population. Forget about the Israel, forget about those Jewish population, you know, scattered all around the world, but specifically in India, you know, yeah. like for example, we have uh, you know people like uh, Nizam Eskil, you know, the poet, you know, he is uh, basically of uh, is a Jewish, right? Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, people have no idea about it. So thank you, thank you for you know uh, putting light on it. And yeah, uh, now that yes, you uh, mentioned that, yeah, yeah, uh, is there anything yeah. you want to ask? No, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Please. So, like, you might have heard of Mehta, right? Mehta, the musician. Yes, yes, yes. And Zubin, Zubin Mehta. Yeah, Zubin, Zubin, Zubin Mehta. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's of Indian Jewish origin. Yes, yes. And yes, the yes. person who uh, there are several well-known Indians also. Uh, of Jewish heritage, but many of them have made it large internationally. Like many of them go to Israel and then their children maybe go to US and there are many amongst them. And there's also a famous singer in Israel who is of Indian heritage and they're there. It's just that it's very difficult to point out, are they Indian? Because <laughs> true, true. Israel is such a melting pot. Uh, like I'll give you an example. There are individuals there. Mother is from Uzbekistan. 
she walked all the way from Uzbekistan. Father is from India. Then wife's father is from Poland and wife's mother is from maybe from US. She came as a volunteer in a kibbutz and decided to stay. So it's very mixed. For instance, my neighbor there, uh, her mother was Indian. I never made it. She had to show me a locket which said a name in Hindi. And she said, see, I have a locket. My mother is from India. And it's then that I could say, oh, OK. And you will find Indians in my dorm during college. Uh, I met so many Israeli Indians. But I could never tell that they were Israeli Indians till they <laughs> opened and they spoke in Hindi or they made it known. So it's not that easy to for me to make out like who are the Israeli Indians. But I can tell you they are making it. They are rising. And especially in the field of arts, like music or and but it's very difficult to pin down the ethnic identity because it's a mixed family. And yeah. And also the food of India is popular. And there are famous Indian chefs also there. Uh, like when Modi, Prime Minister Modi went there, there is an Israeli chef in whose hotel in Benjamin Netanyahu took and they all ate. Yeah. So there are other Israel, Indian use also uh, make it lot, but more in an artistic way, and it's nice. That that's true. That's really true. I mean, since you have taken up, uh, you know, the name of the prime yeah, her name minister. is Rina. Rina Pushkarna. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's really great. Yeah, and there's also another chef like may not be as well known, but you mm -hmm. might know there's a famous uh, academic in Kolkata called Yael Suleiman. No, no, She's I haven't a heard. Of it. Yeah. So yeah, there's also someone called Lava Silman. She's a chef, very well good chef. And then there are other. I'm having difficulty in recollecting the names, but yeah, there are people who have done big. But yeah, you must also we have to also take into consideration that the percentage of the population is very low. And in Israel, it's very assimilative culture. They once you go there, you become Israeli first. These days, at least you are Israeli and rest all identities take a back seat oh and how can we how can we forget general jfr jacob yeah general Architect jacob of 1971 war, victory. 71 war. Yes, yeah. yes 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 so his uh, uniform can be seen even today in the war memorial hill museum, i guess yeah uh, I guess uh, so there's a museum memorial. there mm -hmm. the ammunition hill museum in right, jerusalem right. uh and recently the indian jewish community had held an event also where they celebrated the uh, uh, Indian military generals and officers who were of Jewish heritage and who had made a big contribution. So recently they held a event. I think it was in the month of February or March. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it came in the news. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, and any other question? No. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Jyoti will be coming back uh, again on uh, I yeah. think 10th of April. Yes, 10th of April. Yeah. So Ninth we will 10th, have right? oh, ni ninth, uh, ninth yeah. I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we are we are going to publish uh, the information very soon about his talk and the brochure and all as usual. Uh, but still, I can give you one more minute if anybody has any question. Uh, yeah, I'm glad ask. the question and answer is the best part. Yes, of course, of course, of course. And this is a learning process. You know, I see this entire event as a learning process for all of us. Okay, Same here. Seems... <laughs> now I know what kind of questions are asked, and I'm going to Google most of those. <laughs> now, so I guess uh, there are there are no more questions. Uh, okay, Jyoti Ranjan Pradhanji, thank you, thank you so much for your time, uh, and most importantly, the knowledge uh, that you have uh, shared with us. And uh, most probably, in the next lecture, we would really love to know that what inspired you to reach to Israel, what inspired you to you know uh, get back to the roots of the most persecuted people, and uh, you know explore their pain, suffering, and also you know uh, celebrate their successes right but not today certainly not today but uh, maybe you know the next lecture uh, so thank you so much uh, Avive. thank you so much for helping us to connect uh, uh, Jyoti Ranjan Pradhanji and uh, it, it's really a wonderful experience so uh, with these words uh, I, I as a coordinator of the DOT uh, conclude this session uh, thank you so much for, sir, for coming and we'll meet again thank you so much and thank you all of you the participants thank you so much Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, and happy Pesach, Palm Sunday, Holi, and coming. Oh, Easter. yes. Oh, yes. We are colorful people. We Indians yeah. are really <laughs> colorful people. <laughs> That's the best All thing about India.